Aloha Kako, and welcome to the second lecture in the International Cultural Studies Program speaker series. Today's talk, Skin Flicks with artist Lisa Rihana, is co sponsored by the East West Center Arts Program and the UH Manoa Department of Art and Art History. I'm Marina George, the ICSP Program Manager and the East West Center Arts Program Student Assistant. And on behalf of our program director, Nandita Sharma, and the East West Center Arts team, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. I'd like to remind you to sign up for the upcoming talks in the series. Details and links to registration are available on our website. If you would like to sign up for our event notices and reminders, please send a blank email with the title subscribe to culture at hawaii.edu. I'd now like to introduce you to our host for today. Gay Chan is a conceptual artist who moves between solo and collaborative activities that take place on the web, in publications, on the streets, as well as in galleries. Her recent work contemplates how cartography and photography simultaneously offer and occlude information. Her collaborative projects include being a part of Eating in Public and Downwind Productions. Her work has been supported by Art Matters and the Creative Capital Foundation. Gay Chan was born in Hong Kong and immigrated to the United States in 1969. She received her MFA from San Francisco Art Institute and as a professor of the Department of Art and Art History, as well as interim associate dean of the College of Arts, Languages and Letters at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Over to you, Gay. Lisa Rahana is a multidisciplinary artist whose practice spans film, sculpture, costume and body adornment, text, and photography. Since the 1990s, she has significantly influenced the development of contemporary art and contemporary Maori art in Aotearoa, New Zealand. She's earned an outstanding reputation as an artist, a producer, and a cultural interlocutor with her attention to the complexity of contemporary photographic in cinematic languages expressed in a myriad of ways. Her ability to harness and manipulate seductively high production values is often expressed through portraiture, where she explores how identities and histories are represented. She represented New Zealand at the Venice Biennale in 2017 with a large scale video installation in pursuit of Venus infected. The work premiered at the Auckland Art Gallery in 2015 and has since become a seminal work in Aotearoa, New Zealand's art historical canon. In Pursuit of Venus, Infected has since been shown around the world and has garnered widespread critical acclaim. I could go on and on and on and on to list Lisa's countless international exhibitions and awards, but I wanna pause here just to note that I first met her in 2014 when she presented a lecture at this university's Department of Art and Art History. During her talk, she showed a small excerpt of In Pursuit of Venus as a work in progress. I was riveted on first encounter, but nonetheless was really shocked by its power when I saw it in entirety at the Venice Biennale three years later. I then saw it again in 2019 at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Only this time, the work was paired with the actual 19th century panoramic wallpaper that inspired her work. The wallpaper presented a neoclassical vision of a fantastical Pacific that was among the first of its kind, reeking of bourgeois decadence and disinformation about Western conquest. Needless to say, the pairing could have offered many easy critiques of colonialism, but Lisa's work is much, much more than that. Not only has she shown us corrective documentation of the various dance forms to contrast those frivolously depicted in the wallpaper, through the characters of Lisa's own wallpaper, she takes us across the lines of power, race, class, into the individualities of each of the characters. I must have seen a 64 minute looping video in Pursuit of Venus at least five times. I have never tired of it, and I suspect I never will. So without further ado, I want to introduce Lisa to you now. 
Um, kia ora koutou katoa ngā mihi nui, kia koutou, um, ko Lisa Rehana, taku inga, ingoa, ko ngā puhi te iwi, ko ngā tuki matawharua te waka, ko puho ngā tuhora te maunga, ko uh, ōtaua te awa, um, greetings to everybody. Um, firstly, I would like to thank um, Gay and Nandita and Marina for um, hosting me here today. It's a great pleasure. I'm speaking to you from Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand. Um, this first slide um, I've put on screen um, actually talks about um, my tribal affiliations. I'm, I'm come from Ngāpuhi, um, and that's in the far north of the North Island. Although I've never lived there, I've grown up in Auckland, which is the largest city in New Zealand. Um, but this uh, Ngāpuhi uh, Nui Tonu is my iwi, my tribe, and it is something um, that has really shaped the work that I do in the sense that when I was growing up here as an, um, you know, first generation urban Maori artist, I was always looking for those opportunities that would um, help me understand my identity. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank also um, uh, East West Centre. Um, it was lovely to see on the poster the list of the sub-tribes that I belong to and interestingly um, even just as early as this year I was able to um, not only am I Ngāti Hine and Naitu Te Aoru, I have now discovered um, my, my mother's grandmother which um, associates me to the Naitu Poto um, sub-tribe so um, these things are ever evolving and our understanding of ourselves are ever evolving. And um, so I wanted to just show you this, this chant, this ori ori, which talks about if you were born within the ring of these uh, several mountain or maunga, puhunga tohora, te ramaroa, um, rahari, whiria, pangaru, papata, maunga tanifa, Tukuro and Manaya, Tuta Moi. If you if you're born within those uh, mountain, then you can um, legitimate legitimately um, call yourself Napuhi. So I wanted to to show all those names. Um, the Pacific language or Maori, which is part of the Pacific language group, would be very familiar to many um, of you um, standing on the. Well, I would like to say the unceded lands of Hawaii. So um, within that kind of context, I thought it would be really interesting to, to discuss my work and, and the kind of politics and aesthetics that I've um, been drawn to. And really, um, as an artist, um, has really helped me come to learn about myself my history and and um, who I am. So um, without further ado, I'll sort of jump in and share some images with you. I wanted to talk about um, my time when I was an art student it was really uh, fundamental to the politics that I now sort of investigate through my artworks particularly um, in the early 80s and 90s, um, off the back of many, many advocates and um, uh, Maori activists, there was a great push um, to really start to take hold of um, the skills and the, the tools of their so-called oppressors. Um, and there were some really great um, mentors that I've looked to, particularly in my early years. Um, this image on the top left-hand side is Ramai Hayward. As you can see, an incredibly beautiful woman. Ramai Hayward uh, was an early actress and through her acting, um, ended up marrying the director of the first film that she became famous for. Uh, that filmmaker was Rudel Hayward. Hayward. So Ramai and Rudel Hayward um, then went on to make um, many films and documentaries together. 
And I found Ramai very inspiring when I was um, going through art school. Um, I loved the fact that she sort of um, shifted from being the subject to somebody uh, who was really driving what was happening and being captured through the, through the lens and being recorded. Um, next to her, I have an image of Merita Mita, and I'm sure she's also incredibly familiar um, to uh, many Hawaiian people and many indigenous um, filmmakers throughout the world. Merita um, also um, first came to light, um, to, my, to my knowledge, I saw her on the screen as a, uh, a presenter. There was a lot of advocacy in, in New Zealand, a great push to retain um, te reo Māori, the Māori language, and it really started to become known in the broadcast world um, through Television New Zealand, which is our state um, television agency. They, at first, generously allowed four minutes of um, Māori news. Merita was one of the, um, she was one of the reporters um, for that, um, the Māori news, first called Te Kārari. And from that first four minutes um, grew and flourished a whole, um, crew and presenters, talent, performers, directors, camera operators, sound engineers, you know, it, this, this four minutes sort of grew to what we now have uh, two, there's Māori television and a full immersion to our Māori network now. Um, so we're talking within 30 years, a, a real uh, cultural shift within New Zealand. Um, and what that also did was allow the opportunity for te reo, um, our Māori language, to be heard in a broadcast format. Māori language has only really been um, recognised as um, one of two major languages. Oops. There's only two um, state languages in New Zealand now, and that was only recognised post this push of broadcasting into people's televisions throughout New Zealand. The other important person um, to recognise, I think, is Barry Barclay, and he has proposed this notion of fourth cinema. And that was really very much um, this idea of uh, Indigenous cinema made by Indigenous people for Indigenous people. So really shifting the gaze away from um, a settler, settler view. Um, and he also had this concept of um, the camera on the shore, which um, very much um, could be seen within my work in Pursuit of Venus, um, which is the idea that instead of privileging a European perspective and arriving on the shores, that it was actually Indigenous people seeing um, Europeans, invaders, settler culture arriving, which kind of changes the point of view. So um, I met Barry Barclay, Merita Mita and Ramai Hayward when I was um, at art school. And this, and I suppose also gender politics were very much the politics of the day. Um, when I was at art school, I think there were only seven Maori students and we gathered together and created our own little community so that we had a sort of a support network. Um, and these kind of ideas and the things that they introduced me to at this time have really um, stayed with me throughout my, my art practice. I think the other thing that I would like to just touch upon is, you know, uh, initially New Zealand was very much uh, influenced by British television, New Zealand being a so-called English um, output output, I'm saying uh, ironically, um, but for myself when I was at art school uh, I was very much looking to um, American and Canadian video installation artists. I found um, this new form of storytelling really interesting. I think it offers a new way of um, looking at the screen, screen practice, lens-based practice, 
outside of um, broadcast, TV, cinema, you know, single screen work. Um, I found, you know, and, and also in New Zealand at that time was very interesting for me because um, it sort of offered alternatives, um, new ways of thinking about how we could present works. And particularly, um, I could see that um, broadcast television, documentary making, and cinema was being really well served. But I thought art galleries and um, museums were another place that we could colonize or recolonize. So I set out to sort of work in that space um, and spent 25 years also teaching. Um, and so that was a really great opportunity for me to sort of extend the parameters of um, ways that we could present Māori and Pacific and indeed Indigenous artists could, could um, present our work to the world. I thought um, Bill Viola I found very interesting as an artist. I think because it was, had, um, it was investigating notions of humanity and spiritual experience, but also his interest in dualism, you know, to, to comprehend a subject requires uh, understanding its opposite. And I think that's something, you know, I, I almost feel like I've had a dual personality in the sense that my father is Maori descent, but my mother is English, Welsh and, and Jewish. So that kind of opposition is something that I've really been um, looking into and working out ways of presenting um, and honoring, I suppose, in my own work. Gary Hill, I found his practice really interesting. Um, you know, these kind of expanding the body, um, using multiple screen technology to sort of look at look at um, issues from multiple perspectives. Um, and I just love these images of Tony Uso. I think there's um, a, a humanity and, and humor, which um, I've always tried to also include in the work that I do. Um, after art school, I ended up having my first residency. It was a really incredible experience for me. Uh, I was invited to work in a gallery, um, Australian Centre for Photography. And that invitation came um, in relation to Bamali, which was an Aboriginal urban artist gallery that had just been set up the year before. And I was, in, I was undertaking this residency in 1988 and at that time it was the bicentenary which was um, the so-called 200 years since Cook or Captain Cook had discovered Australia. Two years later um, in 1990 New Zealand was looking at the sesquicentenary 150 years um, of um, colonization of New Zealand. So there was some really interesting politics going on at that time. But also for me uh, as an artist who is interested in lens-based work, being able to look at uh, the po politics um, from an Australian perspective, and this also to see myself from a different um, perspective was really formative in, in my work. I mean, there was a lot of discussion about postmodernism post at that time, but certainly indigenous politics and um, use of um, photography, series of works. Tracy Moffat is an incredible artist and I um, got to know her and work with her. The other person who was in Bamali um, was Michael Riley. There's a couple of images of his um, and he was, um, you know, I spent a lot of time working with Bamali, going to the exhibitions, you know, seeing um, an, uh, Aboriginal people take their own power, um, what we would call tino ranga tanga, you know, self-determination, taking the tools and, and looking at the kind of histories and, and, and positioning them in ways that we would want to see them. So in light of that, I wanted to, um, share a couple of um, images, different ways that I've worked. These are a couple of production shots um, taken from two very, very different perspectives. Um, on the left-hand side, um, I'm on 
uh, working out in the field, uh, making a work called Taifatuki, House of Death. And I'm going to share a short excerpt from that film a little bit later. Um, but I, I love this image because um, if you look to the right hand side, this is um, a production shot while I was making In Pursuit of Venus, which I'll also share um, a little excerpt from. Um, it was a very incredible work to make. Um, and I was using um, green screen technology, really simple old fashioned technology, um, which allowed me to the opportunity to work on a project over a sustained period of time. I actually worked on In Pursuit of Venus pretty much for seven years um, in amongst a whole lot of other projects. Um, but, you know, it's, I, Initially, a lot of my work was done in studio. I sort of had this uh, concept um, that I make images, I don't take images. Um, and that's really um, driven by um, the sense of I'm not a, really a documentary maker, I'm not sort of capturing things out in the field without people's knowledge. I really like to have an opportunity to um, share, um, you know, like the opportunity to make works for me some of the best bits is what happens off screen not the the final work necessarily but the research um meeting people hearing their stories um creating works that give a platform for other voices uh so these are two really different um images um, but I was very in the process of making In Pursuit of Venus I spent a couple of years trying to learn about um, the Tahitian mourners costume of which there's an incredible example at the Bishop Museum and uh, I created it for In Pursuit of Venus and um, while I was making In Pursuit of Venus I really wanted to see what that that um, that and the costume is is the wrong word. It's regalia. It's you know it has so much more power and um, cultural nuance than than um, I'm, that term allows. But because I've made the costume, I really wanted to create another story and see how it worked in the real world. So there's um, really two different points of view going on here, and I want to share those with you later. In Pursuit of Venus um, was a major work um, and it was inspired by a French scenic wallpaper. This image here shows an earlier version when I was trying to work out um, the technology and how to put the project together. Um, but what it's, as a, as a final piece, it's really opened up a lot of opportunities for um, other museums and art galleries to look at their own collections and their own histories, their own collecting practices, etc. This um, presentation here is at Museum Van Loon, which is in Amsterdam, and it was a really um, amazing opportunity for me to present this. It's called the Drakenstein Room, and this is a Dutch um, scenic wallpaper, which is in the room itself. Um, and what's important about this positioning of the work here is Van Loon was the um, insurance underwriter for the Dutch East India Company. So this is an opportunity to start speaking back to Empire um, and his, his great, great, great granddaughter um, who live, lives in this stately home um, presented an exhibition, Suspended Histories, where there was a lot of um, Asian artists also included in the work. And we were really looking at issues of colonization and what it means for people today. Um, in Pursuit of Venus has opened up a lot of opportunities for me. Um, I was able to speak about, um, on the right hand side, there's a waka. It looks quite strange here because we're looking at front, front view. Um, but I knew that there was a gift um, that was, uh, of this walker, there's two of them, and they're at um, the Leiden um, Museum. And this walker is based on mine from home, Na Toki Mata Faurua. So it was a really great opportunity to now look at contemporary issues. How are we? How are we um, dealing with colonisation? What 
opportunities are there for relationships? Um, a group in New Zealand, Toi Māori, helped um, uh, Museum Vulcan Kundi um, arrange for the making of these two waka. And these waka now are uh, looked after in Holland and they're bought out for special occasions or sometimes transited across Europe whenever um, there are uh, events uh, where Māori can interact with them. But what's interesting for me is um, in the process for the opening of the exhibition at Museum Van Loon, we brought these waka in and we uh, we actually, I was trained by this Dutch um, Dutch students, university students, and they were the ones performing haka and um, teaching me how to um, paddle this particular waka. So it's a really interesting idea of an artwork that's um, uh, a, it's a it's a cultural piece that um, keeps relationships alive because it's hosted at a university. Every year they bring four students from the university to New Zealand to learn about um, Aotearoa. So right during the um, treaty um, celebrations or commemorations, four students come each year. So I wanted to extend this opportunity to invite the waka and um, have an interface with the In Pursuit of Venus um, video. Um, and I think what I'll do now is share, I've got a little um, sequence of the video. People may have seen it at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Um, it was a great honor to be able to share this work back in Hawaii. Um, I think this work has traveled a lot uh, around the world. Um, and as Gay spoke, um, it was an opportunity to show this work alongside the wallpaper. So the work has got a strange kind of aesthetic, as you can see, basically the background and the floor and fauna is very much um, taken, derived from the wallpaper. But when you see the wallpaper, um, the, present, the representation of Māori and Pacific people, when I first saw it, I couldn't recognize them at all. It had this very, um, it was very much posed in a, a French um, neoclassical style, um, but I, I found that using the technology of today and taking that as a, um, as a structure or as a kind of a place that I could utilize it to, you know, recast and bring back in these, um, these people and give them a new voice. So I'll just play this now.
So this is just a small um, uh, excerpt from um, In Pursuit of Venus. Um, <coughs> but I, um, for me, when I look at this work, it reminds me of the conversations that happened before, how I arrived at choosing various scenes, um, the sorts of storytelling that I wanted to include. Um, certainly, it was a very complicated work to... Um, to wrangle and try to have as many people as you see in the original Les Sauvage de la Mer Pacific. I'm sorry, I don't have an image of that wallpaper to share at this point. But I think what's interesting even about um, this um, still that we're looking at, Barry Barclay talked about fourth cinema and that's the kind of fourth point of view. And I, I sort of um, enacted this you can see it with the Maori doing the haka. We're actually looking at them from the back. Now the haka is sort of um, a form that's really been co-opted by sport, um, used by tourism industries. You always see that. I mean, it's, it's so um, vital and incredibly um, stirring when you uh, watch a haka and you hear it, you can sort of feel it in your body. Um, but I really chose to, um, make it feel like we are actually standing behind this group of men. These men are doing a haka towards the Endeavour, one of these um, ships coming into shore. And what it's trying to do is to make the viewer feel, you know, indigenize them, um, to make them feel that they are people of the land looking out and watching these invaders, these settlers coming towards us. So just by little techniques and tricks, um, reversing the camera 180 degrees is really trying to enact that for people. Um, on the left-hand side, um, I really wanted to, um, Kumu Blaine, I took opportunities in um, New Zealand. We have a Pacifica festival. And whenever I could, I knew that I really wanted to um, look at that moment of Captain Cook um, being murdered on, on shore in Hawaii. Um, so many, many years before I filmed that scene, I actually recorded this sort of chant and it was, um, Kumu Blaine, I told him how it was going to be presented many years later when I had the chance and um, if he had some kind of response that he would like to include in the work. So, so sometimes when I was in the green screen and working with different people, there was a series of um, scenes that I'd already thought about and, and um, worked through. Um, but other times I was inviting people in and asking them um, to, to um, almost gift something to the project. I didn't necessarily know what it was going to be, but it's also creating that space so that this kind of strange, idyllic, utopian, um, faux Tahitian landscape therefore, therefore becomes a structure upon which all these people, embodiment of their ancestors, their own um, histories and backgrounds, could play out and, and become a voice, you know, the known voice um, within, the, within the work. The original wallpaper does not show um, the European um, explorers and by involving them and bringing them onto shore as well makes them implicit in these histories, um, these histories that have ended up in, in a um, co colonial times that we find ourselves now. Um, so it was, uh, this. I have a website in Pursuit of Venus Dot com, where there's another um, excerpt that you can look at and a whole lot of different images which may be interesting to you, which I won't follow up on now, but um, I just wanted to share some other aspects around the work um, while I was um, creating it and I was raising, uh, uh, In Pursuit of Venus was largely self-funded, hence the amount of time it took to make, um, which was good in the long term because it meant that I was meeting a whole lot of different people and inviting them in to be um, part of the project. Uh, but I also was creating portraits along the way. Um, this pairing of uh, Maori warrior and um, Parkinson, um, I was really interested in where the artists stood. I mean, I've, I've 
often thought about um, what, what is it that artists bring, what they record, and certainly in my, um, in my research, what I found interesting about, you know, Cook's time is the artists, you know, they had to go out, not necessarily with the constabulary, and um, they needed to forge relationships uh, with the people that they were recording. And so within In Pursuit of Venus, there's several little scenes where I'm examining the kind of relationship between subject and, um, and the artist. Um, I created some portraits that were shown in dealer galleries and they helped um, keep funding the project as I was developing it. And in that light, I wanted to, instead of having them against somebody else's wallpaper, I was kind of creating my own. Um, so these are based on tuku tuku um, patterns. Uh, these particular ones are generated from fireworks. Um, and it's really when I was having a conversation with my mother. So, you know, these, although nobody else would necessarily know that, it's, I'm kind of generating my own kind of histories and unseen stories that um, populate the works that I make. Um, I was talking about uh, the chief mourner costume. It's a bit hard to read here, but on the left-hand side, um, there's uh, an image as the chief mourner is walking past us. Um, but I, at the time of making In Pursuit of Venus, uh, my, my dad was unwell. So I was really also learning, creating opportunities where I could learn about um, mourning practices and the different um, roles that males and females um, play um, in, in the ceremonies. Um, and it really came about because I, I knew I was going to show the death of Captain Cook in, in, in Pursuit of Venus. And I wanted to um, balance that up with looking at other types of mourning practices, Pacific mourning practices, laying people out um, on, on, um, on platforms, um, the idea of mourning for several days in a row, um, the letting of blood, um, to, to demonstrate the pain or, um, and um, the, the idea of the body. So I um, created this work, Tai Fatuki House of Death. And um, I also was lucky enough to present that um, in the uh, Hawaii, Hawaii Biennale. Um, and this is an image of it installed in the Bishop Museum. Um, it's a bit difficult to see. I, I really wanted to be part of the Pacific Hall. Um, and I, I felt it was really, really important for me to show this work at that time in this place, because I think the Bishop Museum is an incredible repository of um, culture. Um, and uh, it just felt like it was the right place to be able to share this kind of work. So I negotiated to work with the screens, which generally um, show local, um, local work on it. Um, but I'll just share um, this image here is when I presented it at Auckland Art Gallery. Um, I had this incredibly um, shiny floor, so it reflected uh, to really show up that idea of um, alternative worlds and this after afterlife, this afterworld that we travel to. Um, almost to the centre left of screen, that's an image showing um, the chief mourner costume. And um, I went to a place where there was a uh, a massacre, it was actually a massacre that was brought, brought about by my own tribe with a, a, a tribe just outside of Auckland. So it was a very poignant and powerful place to record this work. Um, it was interesting to, to, to undertake that with actors and, and you know, what kind of um, ceremonies and blessings do are required to ensure that you're um, keeping your people safe so you know there was a, a relationship with the local iwi and um, lots of lots of prayers being said while while we were shooting this um, this production and interestingly I felt like the um, ancestors were talking to us um, particularly there were a lot of birds and different types of birds that would come out and be around us when we were, were recording um, this particular film so I'll just play you a little segment from this
So this work, I was um, looking at our morning practices and, and uh, we recorded it in this place called Kare Kare. Um, it's on a west coast beach, black sand. Um, but this particular glade is a really interesting glade and there's a lot of Pahutakawa tree um, down there. And um, in our, our Maori creation stories, our stories are when, when spirit passes, there's a, a very old Pahutakawa tree that sits at the top of the North Island and that's the spirit uh, te reeringa wairua, it's where the spirit departs and heads back to Hawaiki, our, you know, Pacific homeland, the place where all spirits go. Um, I was also looking at the notion of um, um, the goddess of death um, here, um, represented or played by Rosanna Raymond, whom some people may know. She's done quite a bit of work up in Hawaii as well. I was interested in this idea um, that um, Hini Nui Te Pō is seen as the goddess of death, but she's almost like the mother, the opposite of earth mother, that when you, when the spirit passes from the living world to the spirit world that you are accompanied, that you're never alone. So I love that um, aspect um, of that story. And then when I started to think about um, um, people who have near death experiences, that there is light. So there's always this dual aspect here again that there's the light and the dark um, and and that you know this this light is almost um, being born into the world when people see the light it's almost like they're traveling to another place in time so I wanted to kind of embody these ideas and really it was me kind of um, speaking back to in pursuit of Venus in a way um, it's such a strange utopian Tahitian landscape you know what do what do characters and figures look like when they're in the real world and it was an opportunity for me to take myself outside of you know the green screen studio and just have a reckoning of um, characters in a, in a sort of an actual landscape, a landscape what New Zealand would have been like, more primordial um, in the days that um, the invaders arrived on our shores. Um, you know, these creation stories have followed me, you know, they, they've um, enchanted me all my life. I've, I've thought about them forever. You, um, as a child, you hear um, what used to be called myths, uh, myths and legends. I prefer that they're more documentary, um, but certainly our creation stories are all important. And so I really wanted to think about um, Papa Tuanuku, who is our earth mother. She's, she's the progenitor of all life. And to her left, um, this is a figure um, representing Tane, Tane being the, the uh, god, her son, who sort of created... Um, the world in which humans now live, the living, the living place. Um, it was, it struck me when I started to think about Papa Tuanuku, we, we often hear the stories that she had 70 sons, but there's always a duality and a balance in, in um, Ma the Maori world. Uh, there's also 70 female um, um, marae kura or atua gods, um, which made me think, oh my goodness, uh, she was pregnant all the time. So I did a whole series of images looking and thinking about um, Papa Tuanuku as a goddess and what she, she meant as a mother. So we often think about Papa Tuanuku, Earth Mother, Ranganui, Sky Father. I wanted to sort of shift that a little bit and think about intergenerationality, um, the care that a mother has for her son, even though this is the son that pushed her apart from her husband. So I made this work called Ihi, um, and it plays, it's a public artwork, it's on two very large um, LED screens in Auckland. They're nine meters high. And they sit alongside each other, so hence the sort of back-to-back -back imagery here.
So that image with Papa Tuanuku cradling her belly um, relates to um, Rua Mopo, who's, who's the um, owl god of earthquakes and um, was a great opportunity for me to go down to Rotorua, which is, you know, a very um, busy landscape. Um, and I I filmed um, this, this geyser is actually called Lady Bledisloe, um, clearly a European uh, name. But I, I wanted to sort of start to um, coalesce these ideas of our, our creation gods and goddesses and how they relate to the New Zealand landscape. Um, and then I was sort of thinking also about what it might look like to be inside of the womb. Um, and uh, this is a series of images um, where the brothers almost inside her bodily and pushing and pulling against the sort of cramped world in which they live. Um, it's, um, I think I've got another sequence on my own. I have another website, lisarayhana.com, which you should be able to see um, um, some other excerpts from my work. Lastly, I just wanted to talk about um, Nomads of the Sea. Here's a couple of production shots when we were um, preparing for this work. It was a great opportunity for me to also look at other aspects of what was happening at the same time. Um, Nomads of the Sea is the story of Charlotte Badger. She was a pirate. She um, stole a boat called Venus. And um, I found that really fascinating because the time that she was stealing this boat was the same time that the um, Les Sauvage wallpaper was being printed and made and sort of circulating through European um, circles at that time. So I found um, this a really great uh, project to look at where women's power resided before colonization. Maori women had a lot more power within Maori structures um, than what happened post-colonization. Also, it was an opportunity for me to sort of, you know, compare, contrast, you know, European woman, someone who uh, could find her own strength, her own power. Um, and so I created this work, which was based around her and a woman for whom I named Puhi. And, um, it was really my first film that I shot. Actually, it's not my first film, but I shot it all in Te Reo, And we also shot it in 3D because I wanted to see, um, you know, to, to have this opportunity to show women characters in a really powerful position, wielding their own uh, weapons. It was slightly frightening, um, but I was lucky enough to work with Sir Peter Jackson's studio. And this, was the, this is the camera that he uses when he does his 3D films. Um, the work was developed into a three screener. Um, and these are just a few instances to show um, on the top screen. Um, I went into some more primordial New Zealand landscapes. You know, our, our landscape has been so altered. The, uh, of the land, New Zealand is as big as um, Britain. It often looks small on a map because of the way that maps are made but actually only 1% of land is owned by Māori. And of that, you know, some of the only untouched landscapes left um, are pieces of land that chiefs have gifted to the crown and put covenants over. So it, it's very hard to find beautiful untouched landscape, contrary to the, the way that New Zealand is sold by the tourism board. The second image down um, shows Charlotte, Charlotte Badger as a pirate, as she's just um, taken the boat. And um, below that is um, me sort of looking at a sort of more um, fantastical dreamscapes um, using some characters, um, storyteller who's in the centre, and again, Puhi um, enacting her, um, her dance before she killed somebody. So this is sort of how the work looked um, at in a Biennale last year. And I'm just gonna play, this is my last piece to share with you.
When the first ships came, the worth of the smallest bit of iron was so much, you may think I exaggerated. The immense excitement caused by a ship seen off the coast. Where would she anchor? What iron could be got? Can we seize her? Preparations were made to follow her along the coast, even through enemy country. これ<笑> Not a very nice fade out at the end, but that um, is the opening sequence to Nomads of the Sea. Um, the early image here, um, I found an account from a very early um, European who, who uh, married a, a, a chief's daughter and became a trader on behalf of that tribe. And what's fascinating about it is, you know, it's once the Europeans came to New Zealand, there was a great thirst for muskets and the musket, what the so-called musket wars really took the balance um, of a lot of Maori dying um, and Europeans being in a position with that with the pathogens that they bought, you know, flu viruses, pox, smallpox, many other things, um, really shifted um, the balance of power in New Zealand. Um, and it also, you know, I wanted to have this kind of more um, fantastical imagery to offset uh, the drama and the storytelling that is happening uh, in the central um, screen of those of the three screen work um, and I think oh yes I've got an image here um, just talking about my my newest project and um, at present I'm working for Sydney Modern which is a new building um, being uh, constructed as we speak in Australia and it's called Ground Loop and for me it's an opportunity it's almost like going back to my original aspirations of first arriving in Australia and making long-term um, relationships with um, Aboriginal artists and um, um, Australian culture over there, Indigenous artists. So um, I've kind of constructed this futuristic idea of working a, a, a waka and looking at um, ancient navigation practices um, from a Pacific perspective and then also the creation stories from the first Australian perspective to really strengthen these ties but also to present a much more you know a celebratory form of um, storytelling particularly when you make a work and it's going to be looping and playing in an art gallery for many, many years. I had a more dystopian, um, futuristic idea, which I discarded, um, you know, post-COVID and uh, the forest fires. And we had um, White Island um, blow up in New Zealand and a number of um, Australian um, visitors died at that time. So I really wanted to put out into the world something that's much more celebratory and um, positive. So that's a sort of sense of um, the work that I'm looking at at present. 
Um, that's me for the moment. And perhaps what I'll do. Um, so I have a question here from Vilsuni. Kia ora, Vilsuni. It's so nice to see your um, name in there. Um, he asked a question, could you talk a bit about the role of sound in your work and what factors influence your creative choices? Okay, so sound, um, yeah, let's talk about sound. Sound's really important to me. I, you know, I've often joked that I spend a lot of time um, making artworks, uh, making films, so I can just get into the recording studio, <laughs> which always drives me a bit batty, um, because it takes a lot, but I think, you know, I love, um, I suppose initially sound was a really important device for me. I did a lot of animation films and because I'm, I'm not a native speaker, I'm, you know, first generation urban, I really felt like I needed to use the soundtracks to help convey the story points because I would often go to gatherings and not know what people were saying if they were speaking a language. So it was really for me a close reading, really looking at people's gestures and the inflections in their voice, which to me, when you don't know a language, um, you can hear like the speed, um, the velocity, all those things really help um, fill in what people are saying. So I use that kind of close listening to employ that in a way to convey the sort of storytelling that I like to, um, that's sort of amplifying um, the story, the visuals that are being shown. So that kind of... Um, that drove my interest in sound, but also really puts you into um, another world. So that's really driven um, that aspect. I think the, the stories that I'm investigating, every time I make a new work, it gives me an opportunity to learn more about myself, about the past, about the present. You know, I'm really, uh, I've done a lot of um, kind of <laughs> being driven by history, you know, whether they're photographs or trying to understand what's happening in that, I'm really trying to push past that to, to think about what, what world we want to get to and the world that we want to live in. So it's very utopian at the moment. I'm sort of thinking about alternatives. I think science fiction, polyfuturisms um, are a really interesting place to consider. They give us alternative um, ways of seeing the world. Um, and that's kind of my the things that I'm thinking a lot about at the moment. Um, so Lisa, if I may interrupt a little bit. Um, sure. There are, other, there are questions that's come in through the um, email and Q&A, so I don't want to okay. leave those out who came ahead of time, so if I might bring them in. Uh, the first question was sure. uh, from... Noel Kahana, who has some issues and questions concerning the way you represented Kalani Kupu. Oh, Kia ora, Noel. How are you? It's uh, <laughs> so good to see you. Um, you know, I think so. First of all, um, the you know the visual impact of your seminal work, uh, right, on Venus infected. Um, can't be denied. It's it's incredibly powerful when you're there in the presence of that um, that work. Uh, I do want to say that for me, I did I do struggle with the manner in which Kalanyo uh, Pu'u is depicted, both in terms of kind of his kind of weeping and collapsing, um, and then the Kanaka or the Hawaiian jumping out from beneath the shrub or bush and stabbing Cook in the back. Um, and so I guess my question is, you know, because for the most part, the work appears in galleries or in spaces where most of the audience is not gonna be well informed, right? In terms of indigenous histories, Hawaiian histories. And so how, how are they able to discern reality from a kind of mockery of the original work or between Western ways of looking and indigenous perspectives, because in essence, kind of there's inherent falsehoods in both. 
Mm. Yes, I I absolutely agree. Um, it's it's always uh, it's it's kind of an issue between. I I always face this issue, and I'm sure other people do too, in all sorts of mediums about what how do you convey what it is that you're trying to. Um, achieve and certainly even making the work um, you know in in my mind's eye and when I think about what is the best practice how would I really like to you know my 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 ideal would have been to come and produce Mm -hmm. it or you know work those scenes over in in Hawaii and with more um, guidance from people there you know like working with elders or having you know having um you know knowledge people to be able to help steer that movement and it's something that I try and do in all my work but that's never in some ways it's always a fraud and never a great outcome I mean I I'm constantly um self-sabotaging my own work in a sense it's something I kind of got to a point when I was making things, how how can I say these things and what what kind of what is the work that comes back? What what do you end up on screen? And to me, it, it's, it's problematic. Even and I was very aware, I was thinking of you when I was showing Tai Fatuki and of course, you know, the, the chief mourner. It's it's incredibly problematic. I, I feel like I'm the colonizer yet again. You know, it's almost like you t- uh, even in your hopes to transit that position, even by choosing to 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 tell that story, puts me in that space of being that person. Um, and I I don't I don't have the answers. I really I try every time. I mean, even thinking this recent work um, ground loop that I'm undertaking at present. I'm trying to speak to as many um, elders and tribal tribal um, elders as I can because I know that even more so I'm making a work that's talking about uh, very local iwi politics in Australia and, and even in that process of um, discussion, you talk to two people, you have two completely different perspectives. And it's a very, it's super problematic. And I, and I, don't, I don't see myself as doing a, a really great job at all. Um, I, I think that all I do is try and shine a light on some of the, I mean, I'm just researching how I, think about things in some ways even writing a script and just getting to that point and having people perform it in front of you is almost like the first time you see it embodied like by people by living breathing people and making that scene I I I have big issues with that scene Uh, it's nowhere near how I would like to present it when I read the accounts it's a very very different thing I mean I wonder if you have um in your own work are there strategies and things that you've found or discovered in terms of telling stories and you know like when you make something you put it it's almost like sometimes particularly in video it's living in a screen world and you almost don't even see it until it comes out of the screen world so I want and I'm interested in other people's strategies in a way I see this as a, a place to create a conversation yeah and I just if I can just respond I do want to um, thank you because I it's as you know I think criticism especially of our own indigenous arts community is really difficult right so I think that but we have to be able to challenge ourselves to to sort of put our work out there to to um, allow ourselves to be criticized and to have that conversation and that you know because I do think in essence that contributes then to the to the, our next sort of creative evolution in the way in which we approach our communities and the work that we do so I um, I don't want to take up any more time but I just I want to. Um, <laughs> Thank you for, for responding. Thank you, Noelle, for your question. The next question comes from Nandita, and she wants to ask it herself. Um, Nandita Sharma, and she wants to ask the question herself. I thank you so much, Lisa, for um, sharing 
uh, your amazing work with us. Um, my question is um, this, that in uh, Pursuit of Venus, Infected, you, your work with violent histories allows, from my perspective, when I was viewing it, uh, your work with the violent histories that are accounted here allows for a possible reckoning with our incredibly violent present, right? So this kind of connection across time. Um, you know, in, in that work in particular, I thought we could connect the violence of colonialism with the ongoing destruction of our planet and all life on it. Um, one of the, the, the question that I'd like to ask you is about connections. So an unintended and largely unacknowledged consequence of the violent history uh, is that it forged many connections between people across space and time that you know the that the powers that be never wanted to actually have connected. Um, so, for example, I've recently been reading Saidia Hartman's uh, essay "Venus in Two Acts," and in that essay, she talks about how Venus was the name that slavers imposed upon enslaved black girls and women as a way of rendering their actual lives and beings, as well as the violence that was done to them, uh, totally invisible to us, right? Oh, this is Venus. Um, so how can we account for those kinds of connections, the connections between the Venuses in the slave, it, you know, in the slave trade uh, and the Venuses in the Pacific, right? Like. Um, my concern is that many of the ways that we actually talk about ourselves today work against seeing and strengthening those connections. And one of those um, that I've been particularly concerned about over the years is this idea of settler colonialism, right? We actually have people who would argue that someone like Saidia Hartman, right, a black woman living in New York, is a settler colonist, right? And so completely disconnecting her life from the same kind of, you know, from the lives of indigenous people who who endured colonialism, right? Are there other, are there better ways of seeing those connections so that we don't continuously, you know, repeat this violence? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's very, it is, it's much more complicated once you start delving into those things. And certainly uh, with the Black Lives Matter, um, um, I kept thinking certainly like Indigenous Lives Matter, all lives matter, in fact. Um, we need to be much more cognizant of how our relationships with ourselves and with each other. And, um, and to be incredibly aware of the histories and the lands upon which we sat, stand. And I, I certainly, um, I've noticed uh, working with a few, I've done a few presentations in the last couple of years where, um, you know, there, there's an acknowledgement of country. It's something that uh, I've been discussing with this new work, um, how to embody that within um, the, the new project, Ground Loop. Um, and I suppose initially my storytelling, I was looking, I mean, I've been looking at all sorts of science fictions, um, Oct Octavia Butler, there's a whole lot of people who are using that as a, um, a strategy to look at alternative um, storytelling, um, but certainly to incorporate or model new ways of thinking about these kind of colonial history, settler histories that people have great struggles with. I mean, I think, um, um, I think some of the huge, and I call them organized corporations, the religious corporations that are out there that are put, proposing this really com completely off the wall ideas of how hu humanity is living today is stopping people seeing, you know, and, and coming to grips with the reality of, of what's happening in our world. Um, I, you, you know, ground loop in a way is sort of almost me trying to speak back to In Pursuit of Venus in, in a sense, you know, and some of these um, issues that Noel brought up, I'm, I've been looking at the form of the project in a sense, um, 
you know, from a Maori perspective, you don't go anywhere until you're invited. So in the storytelling, there is um, a, a blessing of country. It starts in the country, the country that's invited me to, to make a work, uh, in the gallery that's invited me to make a work. So there's sort of some, you know, knowledge, being, being aware, being awake uh, as to what the, the systems of power that sit around the work. Then there's um, this embodying this idea of indigenous knowledge practices to start to talk about ecologies and the world and have been aware of it and using um, a waka haurua, which is a Pacific navigation tool to use that to sort of compare, compare and contrast traditional knowledge systems and then it finishes with a gathering and a feast so in a sense it's sort of trying to embody the types of ways that we need to relate to each other that it comes from the gift the invitation the relationships and finishing with food in some ways um, I'm embodying um, a way that I've been taught how we meet with people. Um, and, to, uh, and in this work, I mean, I'm just super aware of um, first Australian Aboriginal people have a horrific history on their own lands. Um, and initially the storytelling was, it brought in some of these um, horrific stories. And then I just, I thought, well, if, you, if something's going to play endlessly uh, in a room, I don't want to have that on show all the time necessarily, because I'm just putting more fuel back into something that I'm trying to, um, uh, you know, sh show a whole new world. So I don't know that that necessarily answers your question, but it's certainly um, a strategy and a new way that I want to work in this project and this next film work. Um, but also there's new technologies now and um, alongside the video itself I can take characters off the screen through AR and I want to start to talk about some of the places you know the where the Art Gallery of New South Wales was a gathering site um, for ceremony to sort of give you know when you walk into a city it's probably like down, downtown Honolulu it's really hard to get a sense of what it used to be like before that, you know, there's, it's a real, it has been such a tourism mecca. It's just to remind people of what happened prior to the colonisation and what it could potentially be. So it's sort of modelling something positive. I sound Lisa, like a new age. <laughs> but Lisa, I, um, I'm going to jump in because I'm the host and I get to interrupt. Uh, well, really, I think that you're kind of addressing... Nandita's question in your work in pursuit of Venus, because the way that you have um, allow us glimpses into the workers' lives instead of just Cook and Colonial Pu, like the more elite characters, um, just the way that the, um, the European sailors kind of get bothered by the heat and the mosquitoes, or how the two uh, indigenous workers they were trying on the clothes and i think that the solidarity is because you allow us glimpses into who they are and their experiences so maybe they, they don't have um there are no sections where they actually interact um necessarily but i think that you do that through the piece itself by what you show us so um it's 1 18 and it's supposed to end this is supposed to end three minutes ago so i know that people are um, already starting to drop off uh there yes. are at least two more questions in the chat. Um, so how about if, if you're willing, Lisa, to give us five sure. more minutes and then we'll see. Sure. Uh, one is from uh, Travis Sefman, who I'm just gonna read it to you. Uh, Kira or Lisa, thank you for sharing all this. It's really something to see that photo of you in pursuit of Venus being shown in the museum Van Loon, the juxtaposition between the video and the decor of the room. I saw this piece at the Royal Academy of Arts in London a few years ago, projected the large scale in an otherwise black blank room. Can you speak a moment about your role versus curator's role and how this is shown in these different venues? 
Oh, okay. Um, uh, Jen, if, if you're really lucky, you get an opportunity to design the spaces that the work is presented in. And um, it's a very long piece. So uh, I insist on having chairs because I'm thinking about elders and just the comfort levels. And I really want to invite people to, to spend some time in that space. Um, I In the Royal Academy, I'm not sure if it was a black room. I usually use blue because I find blue, to me, it sort of speaks of the ocean um, and it also speaks of being in the world. Um, I, I don't always have black rooms. They can be quite um, oppressive, uh, but I certainly did in Tai Fatuki because I felt like that sort of suited um, the storytelling of the work. Uh, they had a crazy limey green um, carpet at the Royal Academy, which they thought looked like grass. Um, and in some ways it did work. I wouldn't have chosen it myself. That was the designer's choice. Um, but I think what was important about the presentation of that work in the Royal Academy is um, there were incredible uh, taonga, um, customary pieces. Um, and, and I think it was really nice to have the voice and song and, and have language and all of that um, within the, the exhibition, um, the grander exhibition, and the fact that there were other um, contemporary artists work shown there. To really talk about that continuum, past, present, future is always embodied. So I feel like that in any works that I do. So thank you for that. And there's one more question. Yes, Let's one more jump question from um, Elizabeth Delari, who is uh, interested in the stillness in your work and um, she wanted to speak. Wanted you to speak a bit about how your work engages with different kinds of temporality, spiral, otherwise basic time and space issues. Um, it's something I think about a lot, and people are investigating, particularly. Um, you know, for instance, there's Rosanna Raymond, and she's just in a piece. A lot of uh, Pacific Islanders, particularly Samoan, talk about Va and um, Te Reo Bita. Um, but I, I often feel that even with the um, talent that I work with um, in Ihi, I find that um, Ihi, uh, I worked with Nancy Weijon as cast of Papa Tuanuku and Tane Miti, who's a choreographer and dancer. I cast him as Tane. I mean, I'm all often thinking that we are embodiments of, um, of these characters or these, you know, our ancestors. So there's that kind of like a, that it is unbroken. Um, for me, it's interesting because they're both Takatapui figures, and I thought that was um, it was quite interesting to to cast them and the kind of you know the pro, the great progenitors of how we are in the world today. Um, certainly, um, we you know in some of our earlier uh, for Kairo on carving practices, um, you'll see series of figures um, engaging in sexual activity, you know, to talk about the, you know, uh, whakapapa, but also that, that lust for life. So uh, I, I also think about, um, you know, third sex, other genders, um, trying to bring them back into the fold because they've sort of been post-colonization erased from some of our histories and some of our practices. So trying to open open up the characterization and the sort of stories um, to make them very, to talk about contemporary issues, um, not in a really sort of obvious way, but just by including them and having them in there, it's just always um, keeping them in, in the forefront, in the figure, in the lens, so uh, they're not forgotten. So, I mean, they're just a couple of things that I've, I've, I think I've done in some of the works that I've made um, in the past. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Lisa. It's 1.24, so I think that uh, I see people having to go elsewhere. But thank you so much, Lisa, for your generosity, just sharing uh -huh. your inspiration and your background and research with us. And I hope it won't be as long the next time I see you. Oh, I know. I hope to get back there. Who, who knew we were going to be so stuck in the That's world? True. And thank you, all <laughs> of you who um, joined us and stayed. Kilda, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kay.